Norway. Welcome back to the land of awe-inspiring fjords, dramatic mountain roads, exceptional wildlife and stunningly beautiful islands. In this fourth episode of my six-part Norway travel documentary series, I will take you to the most iconic must-see highlights of any trip to Norway. We head to the famous Geiringer Fjord, take the shockingly steep Trollstigen mountain road and stroll through the lovely coastal town of Alesund, regularly declared by Norwegians as the country's most beautiful town. Then we will visit the country's largest puffin colony on the island of Runde and head all the way to Dovrefjall National Park in the Eastern Highlands to spot some of the few remaining wild musk oxen in Europe. If you haven't seen the previous parts of my Norway documentary series, please make sure to check them out too. But let's continue on my grand Norwegian road trip to the Nordic. The new morning provided the magical and truly Norwegian experience of waking up right at the fjord. I had stayed the night in a log cabin built above the fjord waters of the Oldebukta, the picturesque Olden Bay at the far end of Fjorden. The serene atmosphere of the morning scenery here was mesmerizing. Olden is also the entry point to the northern side of the massive Jostedalsbreen glacier, the famous Brickdalsbreen viewing point. The drive through the Olden Valley, passing the Oldevatnet lakes, is a pure joy. I drove into the valley in the early morning hours as the sun was just scraping the mountain peaks, making its way into the flanks of the basin and chasing away the morning clouds that hung low above the meadows and the lake waters. Crystal clear waters provided near perfect reflections of the scenery, forcing me to take photo stops at almost every turn. I also befriended some horses that enjoyed the quiet morning hours just as much as I did. Brickstartsbreen might be the most popular and populated viewpoint of the glacier and, while I did not stay until later in the day, I could imagine the area to get quite crowded on a sunny summer day, especially when a cruise ship sets anchors in the fjord.
I could not have wished for a better start into my day, but was eager to continue my journey. My destination for the day would be the most famous of all fjords, the Fjord of Fjords, the unrivaled Geiranger Fjord. But to get there, it would still be a long drive. Keeping with my motto that the journey is a destination, I decided to take my time. I took frequent stops, marveling at the mesmerizing scenery of the Strin Valley. The river Strin meanders in small serpentines through a lush green valley that eventually opens up to an emerald blue lake that provides some of the most panoramic swimming spots I've seen in Norway. Especially noteworthy was Dispaholmen, a small forested island that is connected to the lakeshore by a narrow sandy beach. I stopped at the Jossedalsbrain National Park Center to get some more insights into the glacier and the local flora and fauna. While the center has presented itself in serious need of an overhaul, the museum did feature the world's heaviest rock, coming from the nearby mountains and which was close to impossible to lift. The scenery around the park center continued to be as impressive as Norway gets. Crystal clear blue waters, colorful wild fauna and flora, precious wooden churches that couldn't have been placed more fittingly all with the backdrop of steep mountain faces, thick pine forests and romantic historical settlements. I observed ladybugs, bumblebees, owlet moths and hoverflies indulging in the nectars of bright yellow common tansies. I stopped at the exquisite Obstrin church, a white wooden evangelical church set on a picture postcard backdrop, and strolled along the shores of the historical Hjelle village, where time seemingly has stood still. My drive to Geiranger continued up the tightly meandering deep mountain road with multiple hairpin bends up the upper Strin Valley, providing spectacular views into the valley basin. Further up the mountain I came across a lovely mountain settlement. The traditional farming settlements in the Norwegian mountains are not to be missed, with the typical logwood cabins and huts that are topped by the characteristic Nordic grassy roofs. While I was filming, I was joined by a herd of free-roaming cows that seemed to wear for attention, some even showing off their combative skills. I continued my journey even further up the mountain, which eventually took me to the breathtakingly beautiful Jubatnet. 
This exceptional lake glows in the deepest blues and shimmering emerald hues reflecting the mountain panoramas like a perfect mirror. At this point, I was under the impression to have reached the highest elevation of the road. But little did I know that there was yet another raise in elevation when I took the private toll road up to Dasniba viewpoint. This narrow pass road offered fantastic views, but the experience was a bit tainted by the many buses that moved masses of visitors up the mountain on a road that was clearly not designed for heavy traffic let alone large multi-axle vehicles. Nevertheless, the views from the Dasnipa viewing platform were stunning. Naturally, the near-perfect weather helped to see across the mountain peak range and all the way down to the Garingo Fjord. Having seen Geiringer Fjord from high up, I was ready to head down the mountain to get a closer perspective on the famous fjord. Geiringer Fjord was included on UNESCO's World Heritage List in 2005, and it is easy to understand why. The fjord is framed by vertical mountain cliffs, pine tree filled steep slopes, and culminates in the picturesque village of Geiringer. Over time, local authorities have developed a set of interconnected lookouts and viewpoints that can be either reached by car or through a very accessible pedestrian trail. The lookouts are strategically placed to offer the best vantage points down on the fjord and pictures of Geiger Fjord have become synonymous with the Norway vacation. Of course, the obligatory massive cruise ship had anchored in the fjord and the tourism machinery was prepared to take the passengers on dozens of buses up the mountain but I was mentally prepared to share the experience with hundreds of other travelers and was just happy that nobody closed the access road as had been the case when I had visited Preikostolen early on my trip. I thoroughly enjoyed the beautiful views of the fjord and even ventured on a walk along the harbor and busy cruise ship terminal. All in all, Geiringer definitely lived up to its reputation as one of the most gorgeous fjords in Norway.
I continued my journey past Geiringer, heading back up the mountains to my final destination of the day, the peaceful shores of Norddalsjorden. I stayed the night in the small fishing village of Norddal, where I finished a perfect travel day with a stunning sunset over the glistening waters of Norddalsfjord that shimmered quietly in the evening sun. As decisive as the sun had been with showing itself from its best side the previous day, as mixed was the forecast for the next travel day. I was heading back to yet another ferry to cross Nordals fjord from Eisdal to the small town of Linge. From Linge I took the National Scenic Mountain Road up towards the world famous Trollstigen Road. Trollstigen is a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is famous for its tightly meandering hairpin bends that climb a steep mountain pass. At the top of the mountain, a super modern visitor center is beautifully crafted into the rocks, effortlessly blending into the rugged landscape. From there, a wooden path connects three impressive viewing platforms that allow visitors to peek down onto the road and valley below. The views from up here are stunning. The largest platform dangles above a steep drop of 200 meters providing spectacular views of the many bends of the road below and an adjacent waterfall, the Stiegfossen. Trollstigen loosely translates as Troll's Path. The supernatural creature known as Troll plays a major role in Norwegian folklore and I saw the funny looking creatures standing next to shops and other venues all across the country. Portrayed as spirits of the underground, trolls are able to help or hinder humans, but often choose to do neither. Norwegian tales describe the creature as being extremely old, very strong, but slow and not all too bright. As recently as 300 years ago, villagers, in their unshattered belief of the existence of trolls, would ring church bells for hours in an attempt to keep the trolls away. Not surprisingly, this always worked. I was ready to drive down Trollstigen, and luckily there were no buses around that would have spoiled the drive. Just behind the visitor center, the mountain drop is so steep that the road construction required 11 hairpin bends at an incline of 10%. Given the traumatic topography here, the road is mostly single track with few interspersed passing points. Driving down the narrow road, I thought about the construction workers and engineers that mastered the seemingly impossible endeavor almost 100 years ago. Driving down the road was such a fun experience and I relished every hairpin turn all the way to the bottom of the valley. For me, this was truly one of Norway's top driving experiences. Unfortunately, the weather was not going to hold up. And by the time I arrived in Alesund, thick low-hanging clouds moved into the very hillside that was supposed to provide the best view of Alesund. Judging from the heavy tour bus traffic to the viewing platform, this view was the main draw of the city. 
but the clouds were dead set on staying glued to the mountain, effectively hindering any panoramic views. This is where my drone came in handy. I launched my drone and flew it just under the clouds and alas, had the perfect view of Alessund. For some reason, the weather just 100 meters away from the viewing platform was sunny and clear. I therefore decided to head down into the city center to explore Alessund by foot. And indeed, Alessund is a pretty seaside town that features waterways that cut right through. The town was again filled by masses of tourists, likely passengers from the two large cruise ships that had set anchor in the harbor. I strolled along the pretty marina and could not help but noticing the many colorful Art Deco houses that surely are responsible for Alessund's favorable image. But I still had quite a drive ahead of me and eventually continued my journey, this time not up north, but back in southern direction. My goal was to see the cute puffins that can only be spotted with relative certainty in Norway on Runde Island. Runde is an enchanting island that sits at the end of a series of small and larger islands that are all interconnected by bridges. The trip to Runde required another ferry crossing, but was another amazing experience. Once I arrived on Runde Island, I drove all the way to its western end. Runde's topography is not unlike a wedge, dominated by steep high cliffs falling vertically into the ocean on the eastern side and more gradually rising green slopes and meadows on the western side. The bird's cliffs are located on the eastern side. There, numerous bird families, ranging from kittiwakes, razorbills, falmars, ravens and gannets to puffins, Great skuas and even white-tailed eagles can be spotted during certain times of the year and the day. The only trail that leads up the mountains starts on the western side, heading up a pretty steep path that eventually ends on the bird's cliffs. I walked up the steep hill on the southeastern side of the island, where I was joined by a family of goats and sheep. But when I raised my eyes towards the sky, I was able to make out the contours of a couple of majestic eagles that drew their circles in the sky. The views from the top of the mountain were fantastic. The heavy winds, incoming clouds, rough sea below, and the screaming sound of hundreds of northern gannets added to the dramatic atmosphere. to another viewpoint, I spotted a few ravens that stopped by my side. Puffins spend most of the day hunting for fish out in the sea and only return to the nests in the evening hours. And indeed, as the evening drew closer, a few puffins started to fly closer to the island. Their rapidly beating wing flaps unmistakably gave them away. They beat their wings up to 400 times per minute in swift flight, often flying quite low over the ocean surface. It should take another hour until more and more puffins flew by, and all of a sudden, almost out of nowhere, the first puffin landed a few meters away from me. It's an unbelievable sight 
which I had only experienced once during my trip to Iceland. The puffin looked around, shook his head, presented its colorful orange-red beak, turned around again and flew away. But the next puffin landed even closer to me. More and more puffins settled on the cliffs, playfully shaking their heads and waddling along rocks and grassy patches. Puffins are pelagic seabirds that feed by diving in the water. Their short wings are adapted for swimming with a flying technique that works perfectly in the water. They are excellent hunters and can hold several small fish in their bills at a time. Their raspy tongues and spiny palates allow them to firmly grasp up to 12 fish during one hunting trip. While they resemble penguins, they are a completely different bird species. They form long-term pair bonds or relationships and puffins are therefore often described as very faithful. They breed in large colonies on coastal cliffs or offshore islands and nest in crevices amongst rocks or in burrows in the soil. The female lays a single egg and both parents incubate the egg and feed the chick or puffling. Interestingly, puffins typically live for up to 20 years. Seeing these adorable animals in such close proximity was an unforgettable experience and certainly one of the big highlights of my Norway trip. The next day would be a long travel day. My plan was to head back eastwards into the mountains of Westland and Inlandet and north towards Dobufell National Park. And while I spent much of the day driving, I nevertheless could not help but frequently stop to take in the beautiful vistas of Norway's fjords, mountains and lakes. My personal highlight of the day was the old Strynefjell at Mountain Road, from the upper Strin Valley that I had crossed a few days ago, along mesmerizing mountain glacier lakes to Grotli. The rough and rugged scenery felt both soothing and menacing at the same time. I could easily see how this road could become impassable during rough winter months. But now I enjoyed the calming sound of the wind and distant water splashes from waterfalls, got lost in the emerald blue color of the glacier lakes and marveled at the snow patches that resisted any efforts of the sun to melt away in the summer months. The landscape here in the mountains felt untouched. Only a lonely red rowing boat was witness of human activity up here. From Grotli, I continued onwards to Long, where I visited another famous stave church. My journey followed the road along Otterdalen Valley up to Wagamo, where I took another break next to the shores of Lake Wagovatn.
there, the road went uphill again along Gudbrandsdal, a charming valley with lush green pastures, pine tree forests and a potent mountain stream cutting through the gently flowing landscape. The region around Dombos is characterized by farming and I watched several cow herds peacefully grazing in the late afternoon sun. My alarm went off early the next morning. Today would be yet another grand day. I was hoping to see some of the wild musk oxen at Dovrefjell National Park. The park is also known as the southernmost home of wild reindeer, but they tend to be hard to spot. I drove to the entrance to the national park from where a shuttle bus leaves three times a day to Snorheim, a lodge in the park. Private cars are not allowed in the park. During the 40 minute bus ride, the driver pointed out three musk oxen at a far distance. I was excited to see herds of oxen upon arrival, but after walking around a while in Snowheim, I realized that these animals were much harder to find than I imagined. After an hour of searching, I eventually spotted a musk ox family, a male, a female and a baby musk ox. The latter eventually disappeared from my view. These animals were majestic. I could not keep my eyes from them, slowly getting closer and closer while still keeping a safe distance of about 200 meters. Musk oxen are hoofed mammals of the family Bovidae and interestingly are more closely related to sheep and goats than to oxen. They are truly historical mammals and among the oldest mammals to walk our planet. They used to live in what is now Norway in great numbers around 20,000 years ago. Later native to the Canadian Arctic and Greenland, musk oxen populations got reintroduced in Alaska, the Canadian territory of Yukon, Siberia, and in 1937 back in Norway. Some of the reintroduced Norwegian musk oxen even emigrated to Sweden in 1971, where a small population now also lives. Their most notable features are their thick coat and long curved horns, and the strong odor the male oxen emits during mating season. Male musk oxen are up to 1.5 meters, about 4 feet and 11 inches tall, and measure up to 2 meters in length. Females are slightly smaller. Their thick coat and large head can fool the eye about the actual size of the animal. The typical life expectancy is between 12 and 20 years. And while musk oxen seem rather heavy and bulky, they can reach speeds of up to 60 km per hour, or 37 miles per hour. If they feel threatened or try to defend their offspring, musk oxen can quickly move from peacefully grazing to attacking at high speeds. Tourists and photographers have been fooled by their apparent relaxed demeanor and suffered from significant injuries from musk oxen attacks. I was advised to keep a safe distance of at least 200 meters from the animals and when attacked to run away as fast as I could. The latter was not necessary and filled with a deep sense of happiness that I was able to witness these rare animals in the wild, I made my way back to the park entrance, which turned out to be a pleasant three hour hike with beautiful vistas over the park. I continued my journey further north, gradually coming closer to the Arctic Circle. The next stop on my journey to the North Cup was the city of Trondheim. Norway's third largest city is beautifully situated where the river Nidelva meets Trondheim Fjord. Trondheim was one of the most important cities in Norway during the Viking Age. The settlement was founded in 997 as a trading post and served as the capital of Norway until 1217. I strolled to the lovely city center that is scattered with small shops, cafes, historical timber houses and visited the impressive Nidarus Cathedral. This imposing church dates back to the year 1070 and served as Northern Europe's most important Christian pilgrimage site during the Middle Ages. During that time, and again after independence was restored in 1814, the Nidaros Cathedral served as the coronation church of the Norwegian kings. 
It is considered the most important Gothic monument in Norway, the second largest medieval cathedral in Scandinavia, and the northernmost in the world. From the church, I strolled over to the picturesque Nidalva River. The famous old bridge Gamle Bibro, which dates back to 1681, crosses the river, offering marvelous views downstream where the river is lined by colorful traditional timber houses that nowadays serve as restaurants, shops and hotels. On the other side of the bridge, the Rina on Baklande Quarter invites visitors to wander through the cobblestone streets, relax in cozy cafes, or head down to the river to watch the ducks and seagulls feed their young legs. On the top of the hill, the monumental white Christianstern fortress thrones above the city. Completed in 1685, its function was to protect the city against attacks from the east. My last visit in Trondheim was the Korki Rockheim Museum at the pier of the ultramodern harbor area. Officially named the National Discovery Center for Pop and Rock, this unique museum is housed in an old, modernized warehouse that was retrofitted with a box-shaped colorful roof and has since become a landmark in Trondheim cityscape. The exhibition is dedicated to the history of Norwegian pop and rock music and showcases a multitude of local artists which seemed very recognizable to the local visitors but whose names or music I had never heard before. But I truly enjoyed the musical discovery journey it provided with numerous theme rooms and interactive displays. For the evening hours, I headed back to the fortress where I enjoyed a magnificent sunset. The next day would be the day where I would cross the Arctic Circle for the first time. A long 10-hour drive lied ahead of me and many more adventures as I was about to experience the magical Lofoten Archipelago, a huge bucket list item for me which I cover in the next episode of my Norway travel documentary series.